Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar today. My name is Joel uh, from Practitest, and I'm joined here by uh, Randy. Are you with us? Wait, let me check. OK. Uh, yeah. Guys, I'm I'm actually joined today. We have the honor of being joined by uh, Randy uh, Randall, or actually, as, as at least I know him, Randy Rice. Hi, Randy. Hi, Joel. Um, and Randy has actually agreed, and, and it's a, a great honor of of having him um, join us or or to host him on this webinar as part of the practice webinar series. And Randy will be talking about a topic that I know that it's very very important, at least for many of our customers of practice, and obviously to to testers worldwide. And, and as I was talking to a customer last week, one of the biggest concerns that people have is how to write test cases that on the one hand are light enough and agile enough to be done, but on the, on the other hand that are good enough that they can stand the test of time and you can maintain them efficiently and you can organize them efficiently. And all of those are, are points that, that Randy uh, agreed to talk on and, and based on his experience, I think that it will be a great session. I'm, I'm sure that I will be paying attention to it. But uh, before I actually let him speak, because after all, you came here to listen to him today, I wanted to take two minutes just to introduce him so that everyone actually knows who he is instead of you don't, even if you haven't heard of him. Um, I personally have, have heard Randy speak in a number of conferences. I believe that there were star conference, even though I know that he speaks in, in tons of other conferences. And first of, and foremost, I think that Randy is, is a teacher and he's a great testing trainer and testing coach. Um, you have authored or co-authored, I think, a number of courses, large number of courses. And I think that uh, one thing that he's doing today, he's part of the ISTQB working party for the advanced security tester syllabus. And having worked with the ISTQB in the past, and I know how hard it is actually how much work you put into those, so it's actually pretty cool. And he's also in the board of the American Software Testing Qualification Board, or the ASTQB. Uh, he's a published author and uh, all-around testing coach, as I was saying. And um, he has your own organization, Rice Consulting Services. Um, so, Randy, I think that I mentioned most of what I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, anything else that, uh, that I might have missed, I guess that you will put it in there. But, guys, uh, as always, uh, obviously we're recording this and we'll share it with people. But if you have any questions, go ahead and ask them using the Q&A that you have as part of Zoom. And hopefully we'll have time towards the end to review any of those questions. Okay? All right. Well, thank you very much, Joel. That was a, a great introduction there. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started then. So it's a pleasure to be here uh, with everyone this morning. And uh, we're going to get right into the uh, topics here. I put together um, a little agenda. And they always say you should do that whenever you're doing a presentation, right? And uh, Joel's done a great job of already uh, describing my bio and background, so we'll go right past that and get into uh, some of the challenges of test word management. Uh, Joel, I, I think, really also did a great job of kind of encapsulating one of the big concerns that, that people have. You know, how do you know that right level of, of test case definition, you know, if there you know, is a right level or at least what would be right for your situation. And then I always look at these uh, kind of things at the underpinning of principles and what are some of the things that we can go back to and, and look at. Here are the basics. Here are the things that we, we know and we want to adhere to, uh, not necessarily rigidly, but that they're uh, – in some ways heuristics, in other ways just principles that we want to uh, make sure that we're using as kind of a foundation. And then I want to kind of get into uh, more details about the techniques, how I apply them, and then I always like to make these kind of sessions as practical as possible. So uh, I want to uh, do a little bit of demonstration of how I have implemented some of these concepts using Practitest. Uh, I don't know, uh, some of you may already be current users of Practitest, others may not, but uh, I think that it would be good to kind of see at least some practical application here. And then of course, questions and answers. I've left um, a fair amount of time at the end for those. Uh, I also encourage you 
to, uh, if you do have questions, to put them into the chat window, and we're going to come back around uh, and answer those questions when we uh, get toward more toward the end of the of the session here. Okay, so um, today uh, there are some really key things that I always like to kind of sum it up uh, here at the beginning, just to kind of say, okay, here's what I really want to say, um, and and that is. Whenever you start learning about test design techniques, you'll get into things like boundary value analysis and decision tables and just, you know, there are dozens of really standard good test design techniques. They've been written about since the 70s, okay? Um, in fact, one of my favorite books, I still buy this book and give it away to people, is Glenn Myers' The Art of Software Testing, the very first edition. Um, it's a very small book, but it just really does a great job of talking about many of the same techniques we use today. But regardless of which technique you use or all the techniques you use, you still have to have a way to efficiently manage, perform, evaluate, and then report on the results of those tests. Uh, if test design was all that we did, we could just spend a whole day just sitting around designing tests. But that's only a means to an end. We need to be thinking about, okay, what are we going to do with these tests? How are we going to deal with them? Can we, can we sustain them? You know, things like that. And so one of the things that we look for, at least I look for a lot in tests, especially if I go in and do an assessment in an organization or something, is how efficient are they? Uh, in other words, do do we get the the value for the effort that we've put in to designing the test? And if your tests aren't designed to achieve efficiency, then you're probably not going to get it. And the we're, I'm going to talk more about what this means to be efficient, to be effective. Two different things; they're related, but anyway, we need to be paying attention to both of those things uh, as we start creating and um, designing test cases. Now, sometimes you'll hear, hear me use the word testware. And the first time I heard this term back many years ago, I was a little bit confused by it because I really didn't quite understand what it meant. But I've come to kind of embrace it because instead of really elaborating all the things I'm talking about, like test cases, test scripts, test procedures, you know, whatever, um, I, th this word testware can be used to just really basically anything that you use in testing, right. whether it be a test case, a test script, or a test plan, or, or whatever. Now, the ISTQB glossary puts a definition around it. Uh, work products produced during the test process for use in planning, designing, executing, evaluating, and reporting on testing. So once again, if you kind of cut to the chase on that, it's really just about anything that you use in testing. In fact, you could even extend it to things like test data and test automation and those kind of things. So not to get totally hung up on a definition there, but just to kind of let you know, that's uh, what I mean when I use that term testware. Now, um, over the years, I've coined all these crazy little quips and sayings that I come up with in classes and in and, and other situations. And um, for lack of a better term, I, I use them, I call them randyisms. In fact, I'm actually writing a little book right now to kind of um, document all of these. Uh, not that I'm this great fount of wisdom or anything, but a few times I'll say something and it really resonates. And so this is one of those things that I always tell people whenever they, you know, we're, we're talking about test cases and especially when people get all excited about having thousands and thousands of test cases, I always tell them that test cases are like kids. The more you have, the more you have to keep up with. Now, if any of you are parents or grandparents or something, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's not that kids are bad. You know, kids are great. They're joys. They're, you know, we, we, we love our kids, right? Um, but every child that you have is one more mouth you have to feed. It's one more 
a child you send to school, you have to discipline, you have to, uh, you know, take care of. And, you know, it's just, a, you know, the more kids you have, the more responsibilities you have is another way to see that. And the same thing is true with test cases. The, the more test cases we have, each one of those test cases represent a test we have to perform, a test we have to evaluate, report on, maintain. And so it makes sense that we pay attention to having uh, the workable level, the scalable level. You know, we, we don't want to commit ourselves to a level of test cases that we just simply cannot sustain uh, throughout the test. Now, there are um, a few tests where management challenges here that I want to cover just at the outset. Um, one of the things is the very thing I've been talking about here is having too many test cases because you're in this futile, uh, unachievable attempt to try to test everything. Uh, I'm going to give you an example here uh, in a few slides after this about why this is such a futile attempt. But so that's one thing, having too many test cases. Another problem is dealing with changes that will occur during development and even after deployment into what you might think of as the ongoing maintenance uh, phase of, of implementation. The thing about change is, uh, you know, most people, many people today are in the agile approach of building software. And in agile, the idea is, is that you embrace change and you welcome it and you want to know about it so you can change things. Well, the fact of the matter is that all those changes can ripple through everything that you've done, especially in testing. They can uh, change your test cases if you're doing automation, they can cause you to have to change every single script. Uh, just as a quick example of this, uh, when Selenium went into uh, the Selenium 3 version, there was a change made to the Firefox driver uh, for Selenium. And most people, when they implemented Selenium web driver, they had this um, call to the, the Firefox browser driver. And when that driver changed, uh, a lot of people found that they were having to now go through literally thousands of test cases and change that one line of code in every test script that they had created in WebDriver. And there wasn't really a good, clean, programmatic way to do it. And I've seen this happen in other situations. I'm not just picking on Selenium, but it's those kind of things that can really, you know, surprise you and cause a lot of additional maintenance. So, you know, it's just good to be aware that those things do happen. Uh, also, knowing if your test coverage is adequate. And I also often say that uh, test co coverage itself is very tricky because you can cover something completely, but not necessarily very well. That's another one of my Randyisms in there somewhere that, you know, it's possible to show on a metric or a dashboard or something that we have 100% requirements coverage. And at first that looks great, but then if it's one test case per requirement, that may not, may not be enough. Or you may have 20 test cases per, requirements and, per requirement and they're kind of weak, meaningless test cases. So knowing if the test coverage is adequate for the risk, for the thing that we're testing, that's something else that people often struggle with. And also just maintaining traceability to things like requirements or use cases or user stories, those kind of things can be a little bit tricky at times too. You have to have a test management tool to really do this uh, at any kind of scalable level. And that's why one of the reasons why I do like practice tests quite a bit. And um, also knowing if the test cases are effective in finding defects, you know, so you have this library of a thousand test cases, let's say. And at the end of the day, after you've run those thousand test cases, whether it be manual or an automated tool, the big question is, what have we learned? Have we found any defects, any new defects, any uh, former defects now reappearing, you know, kind of like in a, in a regression manner or something like this. So 
as you look at your test cases, we should always be concerned about, okay, we have these test cases, but are they really revealing anything? And th there's the old um, pesticide paradox that Boris Meiser talked about in one of his books in the 1980s, actually the first book I ever read on testing, and it was back in the 80s to, to, to show you how old I am and how long I've been doing this. Um, but I remember reading that pesticide paradox and at the time just thought it was brilliant because that's exactly what happens in testing, that just like pesticides, when you first use them, they are effective at killing out large numbers of pests and insects and things, but the more you use them, the less effective they become because the, the, the pests actually mutate and they adapt and the, the stronger ones survive and they breed even stronger insects. And you reach a point that, that pesticides are no longer effective in, in killing off the bugs. And we see the same thing in software. Your test may be great the first time you run them. You might, might find tons of defects. And then next release comes along and you find maybe just a few of those defects because they've all been fixed. Now you can consider them as regression tests, but still um, you'll find that you'll constantly have to be refreshing your test library. And then there's the challenge of automating the uh, existing manual test cases. Now this can be a big challenge or it can be a small challenge, de depending upon how you've approached your manual test design. And so that's one of the things I hope that we see today is that I'm gonna teach you the technique that I typically teach in designing test cases because it's one step away from automation. And the things that I do manually in test design, I learned either through my career as a developer or when I started working a lot with automation, and I realized, hey, we could do all this manually if we wanted to. And so I started designing tests, assuming I had no tool, but then if I did have a tool, it would just be easy to translate that manual test into a tool format or into an automated format. So um, hopefully we can make that transition easy, but there's a lot of companies that have all these manual test cases that have just been organically produced over the years, not really managed very well, they may be inconsistent um, and all that. And so when they go to automate them, they basically have to re-engineer a lot of their existing uh, test cases to do that. So here are some key principles. I actually have a couple of slides here. I'm going to kind of scoot through these. Uh, first of all is that the test tools and frameworks are what give us a way to manage, reuse, and control our testware. Uh, when you have this working together well, it's a beautiful thing because you, you have a way to store your test cases and they all work together. And it gives just about everyone some point of intersection into the test cases and how they work. Uh, also, we need to be able to say, yes, we're working toward getting both test efficiency and effectiveness. Efficiency is getting the best value and best effort out of something. Effectiveness is getting um, the best results in terms of, in this case, defects that are found or things that we've learned from the test. Now, I kind of have a short list of things that I try to see as attributes for every test case or every test script or procedure that I write. First of all, there needs to be a reason for that to exist in my library. If I can't justify it in there, then it's taking up space, it's taking up time, and it if it could reveal a defect, fine, but I really take a close look because I, I like to keep my test libraries clean and efficient and really meaningful to do something. Also, they should be traceable back to uh, either a requirement or user story or something like that, but also even be traceable to the person who wrote it, who maybe might be considered the owner of that test case or test script maybe a, respons a, a, a responsible person for that. They should also be measurable in that at the end of a, a cycle of testing, we can say, 
how many test cases we performed, did they pass, did they fail, you know, that kind of thing. Also, they should be modular so that we can combine them together, kind of like building blocks. And they should be reusable, which also works together with modularity because we, you know, we don't want to be having the same test case uh, repeatedly that we're just having basically included in all of our test runs and if so if the if the thing if the test change we only want to change it in one or perhaps a few places as opposed to changing it everywhere and i'll show you how we get there uh, also i like to keep data and process separate as much as i can so what i mean by that is like when it comes to the point of let's say you're entering someone's name into a field I like to say, enter the name as described in the test data file, as opposed to enter Mary Smith. Uh, now, there, there could be cases where you do want to enter a specific value, okay, and that's fine. But just keep in mind that once you become very uh, tied to your data in your test case or in your test script in some way, then you're going to have an you need another instance of that test case or test script for any other pieces of data that you want to test. So if you wanted to test uh, Tom Jones, uh, you'd need a separate thing for him. And, and Mary Smith, you need a separate case for her. So th I, this also speaks a lot to automation, by the way. Um, it's a really core concept in automation that you parameterize your your scripts and then you read them through. We'll talk about that more, but keeping your data kind of in a separate place is, can be very helpful. And also I, I tend to avoid these long and complex test scripts and procedures because they get so confusing and they take so long to perform. I've gone into organizations and I've been on plenty of projects where um, the vendor, for example, might deliver a set of test scripts and they're 20 pages long each script you know to do one function and at that point it's just almost too much to deal with so i like to break them up and make them modular make them reusable that's my goal also one other thing too the more detail that you have in your test where the more brittle it becomes now i worded this very specifically because i'm not saying that you can't have details in your test where I'm just saying that the more things that are highly specific in it, if those things ever change, then you're going to be changing a lot of things. Uh, an example here, and I'm going to show you an example doing this actually, is if you have a little statement that says, click on the go button. Okay. Well, what if the go button changes to something else like submit or something like that? then you're going to have a decision to make. Do, do I go in and change all my scripts or, you know, how do I handle that? Um, you, if you have it in a step that you can reuse, then you could just put it there and not worry about it as well. So th there's perhaps ways around this, but just realize that. And, and by the way, this also applies to your test planning as well. So if you have a test plan with a lot of specific dates and uh, things that are, highly subject to change. Uh, the, the more you have in there like that, the more your test plan is probably going to change as well. And to achieve higher levels of test efficiency, you need to be able to combine your test conditions in intelligent ways. Now, there's many tools for this, and I this kind of goes beyond the scope of our uh, topic today, but I just want to mention that. In fact, I will show you the effect of it, uh, but I don't have time to get into exactly the ways that you would want to combine these test cases. It gets into like pairwise and other kind of combinatoric methods that, that you can apply. But the, uh, the data-driven concept, uh, once again, is primarily used in automation, although you can certainly use it in a manual uh, context as well, where you have the, the script that is basically the descriptor of the process. And then every time we need data, to support that script, we know where to go get it. We get it out of a, a spreadsheet or a, t a table or something. And so when we want to do another round of that script, we just go back to the test data again. Now, of course, the test data will represent 
multiple conditions. And maybe each row in that data will be a different condition then that we'll want to feed into our script. And the script can remain the same, but the script can also handle the differences in the conditions and in the data that we'd want to perform. So at a very, very high level uh, view, this is the concept of the data-driven uh, concept. So the way that that actually plays out with modularity is let's say that we want to do uh, one test and the person that's going to be the, uh, the, the, the test person here, let's call it the test entity, is gonna be John Doe, okay? And so we're going to add John and we're going to say, okay, that's going to be script number one where we add a customer. So John Doe will be our customer. Then we'll have another script to change a customer. So we're going to change John Doe's information in some way. And then let's say we have a third script to delete a customer. Okay. And so we're going to delete John. Now, if the scope was small enough and if you know, we can justify it. We could do all those in one script. We could add, change, and delete a customer, okay? But think about large-scale situations where you may have 10 other scripts or 20 or 30, and adding a customer is just one of them. Now, I'll show you the effect of this. So, we, we do a second test with Mary Smith, and we're going to add Mary That'll be script number one, or in some cases, you may choose to see these, by the way, in test cases. Um, that's totally up to you. And then we're going to try to add Mary again as a customer. Now, your system should probably be able to accommodate two Mary Smiths. Now, it may not accommodate two Mary Smiths with the same billing address, however. So, it would be important to test what happens if we try to add the same person repeatedly, okay? Now, we've, had, we've added another test, but no new testware, okay? And we do another, a third test with Pete King, and we add Pete, and we go in, and we delete his information, and then we change his, or go in and try to change his information, but of course, we find that it's not found. So, in this screen here, in this one slide, we see three separate tests with three different purposes, all using the same three test scripts or test cases, depending upon how you want to see these. And the other big benefit here is you'll notice that I've made them consistently uh, the same color. So all the ads are in greens, all the changes are kind of in tan, and all the deletes are in orange. So let's say something happened in our ad customer process that now a new step is involved or a new item to be entered or something to be clicked. Now we don't have to go into every script we have and try to find out where are these, these steps to add a customer. We can know exactly which items we want to change. Okay. Now, in practice tests, this would probably be the equivalent of like a test step, or you could pull a test script, a test step from a particular test case. So that would be kind of the the same idea there. Okay. So that's what we're going for. Now, once again, three cases, three tests doesn't seem like a big deal, but in a lot of the tests that I work with, we have probably dozens of, of cases and scripts like this that we recombine into uh, maybe even hundreds of tests. So that's one of the ways that I, I design tests very quickly and with a lot of coverage, a lot of good results from doing this. So just to kind of maybe come back and, and describe this one more way, so the the idea of a framework is that of that you have a basically a main script or driver script, and that driver script will also interact with test data. Now a lot of times this is done in the automated side of things, but as we're designing tests, we need to be aware that we're designing tests to fit into and to support this kind of idea. So. You may have one case to add a customer. You may have another case to place an order. Um, you may have a third case to cancel an order. Uh, a fourth case to confirm an order. 
Now, for those of you great testers out there, you've probably just said, hey, there should be an arrow there. Well, I left the, the arrow out because that case may be in your library, okay, to cancel an order, but it may not have an appropriate place in the particular test run that you're performing, okay? So you may not want to cancel the order in every particular case. In fact, if you did that, then you would never be able to complete an order, right? So anyway, you have another, that case to confirm an order, and then finally to ship the order. And each of these test cases will have a condition or multiple conditions with expected results. And that is really the heart of a test case, will be the conditions and the expected results that, that you hope to uh, see there. Now, of course, there's other things too, like you may have preconditions and post conditions and things like that. But that, that's the heart of what we're saying. And so that you work from top down in that driver script and it will invoke these other scripts as needed. And in fact, um, if you want to, if you have, if your tool, if your automation has the ability to do this, you can even go into more of a keyword driven approach for that driver script. And so if it encounters the keyword add, it will call in add customer. Or if it says add customer as the keyword, it'll call in that or place order. If it detects those words, it'll call in any cases that uh, have a place order in them, those kind of things. So anyway, that's kind of the concept of, of the framework. Now, let's get to the volume issue here for a minute. Um, realistically, most of us have pretty firm constraints on how much, uh, how many test cases we can have, how much time we have to test. Um, sometimes I've been called the master of analogies because I have all these crazy analogies that I use in software testing. And one of them is the suitcase analogy where, you know, like doing risk-based testing and doing test prioritization is like packing a suitcase. You have to put your big and important things in first and then your smaller important things in around those. And then finally, your lesser important things in around those. And if you don't put the important things in first, then you'll probably have trouble ever getting them in because they may be taken up by all the trivial things that you want to put in there. So just like packing a suitcase, when you have a time box, basically, it's how much can we put in the box, okay? But it's even more than that, okay? It's not so much, it's not only what we put in the box, but it's how we put them in the box, okay? It's how we get them in our library. Now, you'll notice the picture here on the right, uh, the clothes are all rolled up. And this is a very neat way to pack a suitcase, as opposed to what we saw in this slide. Now, the clothes were folded here, but you've probably had this experience of trying to cram everything down into a suitcase before. Well, there are people that are actually very good at packing in tight places like this, and they roll their clothes up. They have really specific techniques. So the what to test, what we put in the suitcase, is driven by things like risk and criticality, what the stakeholder really wants, and maybe perhaps even other criteria. But the how to, how we're going to actually get things in a concise way, uh, and all of that is driven by our test design techniques that especially are around things like optimizing testing. And when I use that word optimize, what I'm talking about is getting the most testing for the least amount of tests. And when I say the most testing, I mean you're, you're getting the most test coverage, okay, from the least amount of tests. So uh, two classic techniques here for doing that are equivalence classes, which are also called equivalence partitions, and also combinatorial test design. So pairwise um, and orthogonal arrays and those kind of techniques are considered in the, that family. So here's a real world example. I, I was working with a client that uh, they were a mutual, they are a mutual fund company and they were designing these tests for bond investments that they were processing. And so there were six categories 
of conditions and we had them all out on a spreadsheet. And so there's the fun type that had two conditions, collateral had two conditions. The, um, the ID number of the trade had three conditions. And even at that, we, they could have had many more here, but they just said, we're just going to say, is it correct? Is it missing or is it wrong? Those were the three conditions for the ID number as well as for the face amount and the need by date. Okay. And then they hit this really tough one. They had uh, 15 different brokers that they had to test against. So no matter what we did with anything else, we always wound up multiplying by 15 because of all those brokers. And so the total number of cases, if we wanted to test all the combinations of conditions, um, would be two times two for these first two, three times three times three, so three cubed or 27. So it's four times 27 times 15 is 1,620 test cases. Just on a really not all that complex example of what we see here. I mean, you've probably dealt with much more complexity as have I. But anyway, then we were brainstorming this and somebody observed, you know, those 15 brokers could really be expressed as five broker types. There are things like banks and mutual funds and insurance companies. And anyway, if we did some more analysis and confirmed, yes, that's true. You know, we really don't need to test all 15 brokers to get full coverage. If we just test them as types of brokers, that would be adequate. So we just changed that 15 to five. And now the total number of test cases became 540, which was a two third reduction in our test cases, but we didn't lose anything in test coverage. And that was a beautiful thing, you know, and that's the power of equivalence partitioning. Um, now equivalence partitioning assumes that you know exactly how things work and in a particular partition and all that. But still, I thought that that was a, a pretty good example uh, of how you can get some good power without any kind of tooling, without any kind of optimization other than just seeing how you can group things. So the reason we need optimization is because many times we do find ourselves in these situations that we do have high complexity, lots of conditions, we don't want to maintain thousands and thousands of test cases and we don't have those resources to do that. But at the same time, we need confidence in the test. I'm going to show you one more example. Um, you get into Internet Explorer and uh, even though it's a phased out uh, or, they're, or they're phasing out that browser, uh, I still use the example that in the options uh, the advanced tab under internet options, you'll find uh, 53 checkboxes in there. Now, in some of these cases, you kind of have some mutual exclusivity going on there where you can't have two checks on at the same time, but, but let's just say for the most part you can. So if you had, if, if you wanted to try to test all the possible combinations of those binary conditions, it would be two to three, to the 53rd power, two because it's either on or off, and 53 because of the binary conditions. And then you have three groups, uh, you have a, one group of radio buttons that has three options, another group that has four. So you have a 12 because three times four. So you have a uh, nine quadrillion plus times 12 is a 100, 108 quadrillion plus possible combinations of conditions. Just to put that in perspective, if you were to do one second per test execution, it would take um, over 30 trillion hours, uh, over uh, 1 billion days, and over, I'm sorry, uh, 3 billion years, uh, and then over 1 trillion days and 30 trillion hours. So in other words, uh, more time than we would ever have in our, in our lifetime to do it even once. So even with automation, that doesn't really help you. So that's where the combinatorial techniques come in because what they do is they take each of these conditions and they help you to combine them. Now, here's a, a takeaway for you. 
a lot of research has been done, uh, I believe, to count now over probably 20 uh, projects on why do we miss defects, um, you know, in our testing, how, wh these escapes as they're sometimes known. The problem is, is that we have, we tend to be thinking in terms of testing um, isolated conditions. Okay, so condition A may work, condition B may work, and condition C may work. Um, but when you combine A and B together, ah, I have a failure, or B and C, or A and C. And in fact, what the research is showing is that probably about 95% plus or so of the defects that we miss could actually have been found if we had just tested all pairs of the conditions and, and what it is, whatever it is that we're testing. So the bottom line is, is that a, a lot of times people see the pairings and that takes you way down in your count, okay? It, it may take the, that 540 that we were just talking about and take that down into 12 or 10 or something like that. And people feel uncomfortable because they're giving up a lot of tests, and that's true. But the chances of having a double mode defect like this with condition A and B is much, much more likely than having three things that fail together. And by the way, if you'd rather test with three things working together, there are tools out there that will easily let you just bump it up and you can have a few more test cases and you can get all the triples as well. So um, I don't have time to go into how you do that, but that's the concept of, of stacking your conditions. Now, before I go into practice test, uh, just one other word here about efficiency versus effectiveness. You really need both. Um, efficiency is getting the most uh, value and the most information from the most optimal, optimal number of test cases. You're, you're lean and mean at this point, as they say. Um, redundancy is not desirable when you're going in for efficiency. However, and I have a little typo on my slide, I see, a little overlap may actually be good because uh, kind of like um, a roof on a house, you, the shingles are typically overlapped, you know, just so that the rain will not hit the cracks. You don't want gaps in your test cases. So in some cases, you may find that overlapping conditions and cases may actually have a little value to you there. Uh, one way to say that is you may be doing some of the same tests that the developer may have done, but doing it in a slightly different way. That would be an example of how you may see overlap. Now, effectiveness, on the other hand, is getting productive information from the test cases. This could be either the number of defects that can also be a little bit misleading, but more valuable than that is just what are we learning from our test cases? Uh, a test case is effective if you get something from it, okay? Either a, if you find a defect or you're getting information. Uh, efficiency is getting the most uh, value and most um, results from the fewest or most optimal number of test cases. Okay, so <clears throat> now I'm going to kind of uh, go into practice tests for just a few minutes here, and I'm going to show you some of the ways that uh, I have uh, done this. And let's see here. Oh, there we go. Okay. And by the way, I'm going to mention, since I know Joel is uh, still listening here, Joel, if you see me doing anything that is egregious or anything that you want to chime in on, please let me know. Um, so here is, I, I put together a few examples in this uh, demo project. And I'm going to say a few things here that, um, I'm not going to assume that everyone is familiar or uses practice test, but I just kind of, kind of want to show a point of connection here. So the thing that I'm testing, let's say I want to test an order entry process. And some of the main things that we're doing um, in the order entry process, I've actually created a, um, 
a filter for this over here. And um, in the order entry process, I'm doing things like adding a customer. Um, I'm doing things like placing an order with the item being in stock. Um, I'm also uh, payment method accepted. Uh, and in this case, it, this is a credit card test case because perhaps someone might pay with a purchase order or something and that process would be totally different than the credit card. Okay. So <clears throat> the way it begins, um, probably the best way to see this uh, is if I, if I look at one of my test sets and test runs, uh, just to kind of show you where it, these have kind of gone here. So the order entry and payment and the the idea here is that this is our happy path test. Okay, this is the successful one. Um, we see the, the dashboards, but then down here we see what we're doing in terms of our, our test instances, as we're calling them. We have a valid login, we add a customer, we place an order item in stock, and we make payment by an accepted method such as credit card. Now, one thing I haven't really talked about to this point uh, is I have another over, uh, overriding way that I think about testing that really makes it go faster. And that is I take a scenario based approach in my test design. So I'm thinking how will an actual user perform a series of transactions or a series of actions to complete something for someone from beginning to end of us dealing with them. Okay, so I think of this as a scenario approach, a life cycle approach, however you want to see that. So in the valid login, you know, this is a, a test that we can pull in uh, as a, um, as, as kind of a, a standard test that we have set up there and we don't have to create the valid login. Okay, I pull this in actually from another uh, test. And so I was able to get the reuse out of that. Now I'm going to go in, I'm going to show you what, what it looks like here in just a moment. Okay. So I'm going to go back to my um, login test and we'll look at the steps here. And it's basically to open the browser and the site and then enter the valid login information. And you'll notice here that you can do call steps from another test. And that's exactly what I had done. And the test that I was showing, I pulled these steps in into my other test. So I was able to take advantage of, of that reuse. Okay, so now I'm going to go back here to my, to my test and we're going to look at a few of these cases. So one of them was to add customer. Okay, that's test number 13. Uh, you give general information about it here, but then under the steps, Look what step number one is, test number three, log in without parameters. So I did not create a new step right there for this. I just simply pull this step in from another test. Okay, I'm gonna go back. And then um, then when I go into my uh, add customer, I'm going to go to the customer entry page. I didn't have an exact URL to show there, but a page should display all the customer fields correctly. And then this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Enter one instance of customer data as shown in the attached spreadsheet. And the customer entry should be accepted unless it is a duplicate because duplicate names are allowed, but not duplicate addresses. And in fact, we have a requirement that I don't think I've linked it to yet, but I have a requirement that says that duplicate names are allowed, uh, but duplicate billing addresses with names are not allowed with the same name. Um, so what's in this uh, spreadsheet? Well, you can upload spreadsheets to go with this. And so the one that I put up here looks kind of like this. Um, we have the name, the, the company, the phone, um, billing address, shipping address, and then even the order information because I have a test case to enter the order. And so I have certain little 
sets of things constructed. I have things that are in stock, things that are out of stock, things that are taxable, things that are non-taxable. And from that, you can kind of see the conditions start to emerge. Okay. Now I'm going to show you one little quick trick and I realize I'm, I'm dancing on our last few last minute here of doing this, but um, I want to, if you need to uh, create a bunch of test data in a hurry, there's this website called generatedata.com. And um, I'm just going to do the real skinny version of this. It's free. Um, that you can also get the script and run it on your own server if you want to. And I'm going to make it specific in my case here to the uh, US. So let's say the first column would be um, first name. I'm going to pick a, a gender neutral uh, first name, uh, last name, and pick a surname. And then um, let's just say company. And then we'll say phone number. We could put addresses and all that stuff out here. But um, and so you can have the, the US option there. And then you can create it in comma separated Excel sheet, HTML, JSON, uh, SQL if you want to build a table or XML. I'm going to generate an Excel spreadsheet that I can download, prompt to download right there. I want to generate 100 rows of it. And it will. Let me save it, and then I will go in and I will open that one up, and you'll see there the what it's created. And so, once again, this is not the most robust data generating tool that you have, but if you wanted to have some test data that you could incorporate with your test cases. And once again, this is something that happens primarily on the automation side. And by the way, there is functionality within practice test for automation uh, and to link to um, all kinds of automation tools. Uh, Selenium is one of those if you're big in, into Selenium. But anyway, to kind of wrap this part up and get into some of your questions, um, the, if, if I go back to my uh, test library, um, we go ahead and see things like place the order uh, item in stock. I would also have a test case item not in stock. Okay. So one of the things I do in my test cases, I will start toggling conditions. So if I have items in stock, I want items out of stock. If I have accepted purchase order or purchase methods, I want to have non-accepted purchase methods. And so this just walks through the steps. Uh, I did not put the login step in this one, but um, this is just the steps in actually doing the, the test. We, um, we search for the item by name or part number from the list of displayed items. We select the desired one. If more items are needed, we go back to step one. Uh, otherwise, finalize the order. So we've kind of got a little loop going there. And then we confirm the items, the quantities and prices, and then we finalize it by choosing the submit order menu option. I did not say click submit. I tried to keep it fairly generic there if I could. So anyway, okay. Uh, I'm going to now take us back to the slideshow and um, there, there are so many other things that we could say there about uh, practice test and how it can be used. I personally love it because it, um, it's very compatible with how I teach uh, my test design, as you can see from what we just saw there. So test design and test active and test organizations, a uh, test organization 
are very nuanced activities. There's a lot of stuff around the edges. And there are many times that I've had to start over. You know, we spend two hours doing test design and I say, oh, it won't scale. Um, or it's too detailed or it's not enough detail. And we have to go back and we have to, to do over. Okay. But find it early and just realize that, Hey, okay. Going from textbook to actual practice, you have to try some things. Also make sure every test case you have or test script adds value to the test and use a good test management tool because spreadsheets are just too hard to manage once you get up to any kind of significant scale. So um, I hope this information has been helpful to you. We have a few minutes here for some questions. Um, and so I will, uh, I don't see any open questions out there, but if anyone has any. Um, so I actually have a, a couple that um, mostly came from, from customers that I have been talking to lately. And, and I just want to bring it up because I provided my answer, but I want to hear also your input into that. Uh, first of all, great session, by the way, I really, really liked it and, and really like how you showcased the tool. One of the things that you also can uh, notice in practice that you, as you mentioned, sometimes you want to have the data as something that is less hard in it. So we also added the, the ability to parameterize data. And again, if someone wants to see it, then later on we can surely show it, but you can define within a step in the test library a parameter that will be populated dynamically during the run. A little bit more advanced functionality, but, but something that is pretty useful along, along the lines that you were talking about. Um, and by the way, I really like the generate data tool. I was not aware of it, so I will sure get to use it. Uh, really sure, soon. sure. <laughs> it sounds very cool. Now, I have a question, and you even mentioned that, yes, uh, in your last comments. And, one of the biggest questions that people ask me is, hey, when should we t start taking out test cases? And you've said it a couple of times, test cases should have value. Um, and one of the things that I, I, someone asked me even last week was, wait a second, if I have a test case that hasn't find a bug in the last year, in the last year and a half, two years, should I take it out? Meaning, what should be that criteria that will show me, hey, go ahead and, and, and take these test cases out because they're not providing value to what you're doing? Well, that's a tough question <laughs> um, because, you know, I, I, I would almost, I almost say that's one of those it depends questions because um, if, uh, you know, in some ways, if, if that test case is guarding or, or is there for the purpose of trying to make sure that something really critical still works, then you'd probably want to leave it in. Um, if it's something that is lesser critical and, you know, it doesn't get touched very much, of course, that's the essence of regression testing. Um, th there's a real balance in there because, you know, there's a misconception around regression testing that regression testing is do running all your tests every time you run a test. And that is a fairly recent view of regression testing. It makes it it, tools make it more achievable to do that. But I think it's smart to at least ask the question, do we still need it? Now, the, it, the I think the question all boils down to risk and criticality, uh, you know, and what that test case is guarding. If it's something that, uh, you know, could have a high impact if it failed, eh, it'd probably be better to leave it in. If it's something trivial and something that we just don't need anymore, it may be something that you could at least deprioritize into maybe a second round. I, I never hate to, I mean, I always hate to just totally delete a case from my libraries. I, I may shuffle them over into a secondary library or second tier kind of test for later. But, you know, it, it, there's a lot of investment. I didn't, didn't even get into that in the webinar that, you know, these test cases all represent a huge amount of investment to a company. So you don't want to just throw that away. I totally agree. I usually tell people you shouldn't delete automatically, but you should at least be aware that you know what to be done. And one of the things that I've told people is, you know what, throw it into the sanity or into the smoker, try to see how we can scale it down. So, so it sounds like more or less the, the same approach. Now, another question that I, that I was asked uh, in the last couple of weeks is, how do you 
design tests differently based on who you know is going to be running the test cases. Uh, and the main example is, okay, so I might have some test cases that will be run by power users and they know the system inside out, whereas I might have some test cases that will be run by users who might not know the whole functionality, so you want to handhold them a little bit more. So do you mm -hmm. design your test cases differently based on who are going to run, who's going to run these test cases? Mm -hmm. That's a really tough one, too, because, you know, the, I've always heard that, too, you know, and I've always tried to keep that as kind of a golden rule, you know, design your test to your audience. But the tricky part is that we don't always know exactly who the future audience may be. I mean, this year, it might be the uh, neophyte users or it might be the power users or whoever, but two years or three years from now, it could be someone with a totally different uh, set of skills that will be uh, using the test. It, it's a really tough thing. In fact, I've been surprised even when I did know who the actual users were. Um, I, I, I had one situation where the software was so complex, even the BAs who wrote the use cases couldn't run the scripts that we had written um, because the, so it, the software was just so complex. And so, I don't know. It, it's one of those things where I, I try to find a happy medium um, and give, give ways, at least if I don't have the detail in the script, a place uh, indicated on the script where more detail can be found, like user documentation or um, maybe rely more on the traceability if there's like use cases in place or any kind of documentation, link it into the test case. Um, but it's hard, you know, it's really difficult to get that down right because, you know, our our foresight is just so limited as to who those actual future testers may be. Um, but, but Joel, we have a couple of other questions here um, from Ronald. Mm -hmm. um, the, is there practice test norms or is every test left to the tester? Uh, that is one. And is every design of test left to the tester? And I don't know, Joel, you may want to handle those. Um, from the practice um, test perspective. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I even understood the first one. I thought it was a little bit of a kind of a strange question. Um, is there practice norms or is every tester left to the tester? Um, basically within practice, you do define who is going to be running your test cases. You can assign them to. Um, there is usually uh, a process to writing the test cases to defining them. So you may have more architects doing that, but again, it really depends on, on how you want to manage that one. Um, so, so it's very flexible in that account. Is every design of tests left to the tester? I think that this one would depend on the organization itself. Um, mm -hmm. There are some organizations that have architects. There are some organizations that say, uh, well, we have architects and we have testers. I personally do not subscribe to that uh, school maybe, but um, I do see the place where, where you might have it, especially if you're doing a lot of crowdsourcing or outsourcing, you may have someone who has a, lot, a deeper knowledge of the system who will actually go ahead and, and write those. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. And I, I think there, are, there may be some tests that you need someone that is maybe in that test analyst role that understands have kind of have some deep understandings of the techniques of like decision tables or state transition test or whatever it is that you're doing that pairwise. Um, and then some of those are handed off to testers, but I always encourage, you know, I, I, I hate to just kind of leave it as this role of quote unquote tester um, as someone that just runs a test and reports, because I just see that as such a, um, almost like a robotic role that your job is on the line there because you could be replaced by a tool. I, 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 I encourage every tester to have thinking skills and test design skills and that adds value to the organization. So, you know, just to run a test and report results to, to me, I think is less than what most testers should be aspiring to. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I, I totally agree on that. Um, and in any case, we're actually, I've been told that we are running a little bit <coughs> uh, behind time. So um, Randy, I just want to thank you very much for this great session. And I think that you covered some excellent points and, and some very practical ones. And, and that's actually a, a great thing. And I want to thank you for that. 
Uh, and oh, good. I want to ask you if, if someone wants to to get a hold of you, then I guess that here people can actually see. Uh, yeah. And again, thank you very very much for for this opportunity, and uh, we look forward to to again collaborating in the future. Thank you, Joel. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, guys. So just as a reminder, we have been uh, recording this one, and we will be posting it uh, shortly in our uh, YouTube channel. So, Randy, thank you very much, and to everyone, thanks for joining us. Bye bye, and thanks a lot.